The first question I want to ask you politics, fashion, sexuality, religion, film, film Nigeria, sports, sports. Music. music, the course of my career. Just ask. Hi, yes, it's a new week and it's time to ask for me. And you know it when you see me grinning from ear to ear, it's because I've got my hands, or shall I say my fangs, on someone else and someone I really like. Or shall I say someone whose work I really like. So, last year, flying to Rwanda, I started reading this book. I did not put it down until the end. I know I'm acting all excited. That's because these days it's hard to find books that just grips you, grabs you, and won't let you go until you finish. The writer of this book is with me in my home today. Leye and Dele is not just a writer, he's also an actor and a satirist and other things that you'll discover in the course of this conversation. Hi, Leye. Hi, thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> I love the book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I really, really do. Uh, do people tell you this? Oh, this is the first time I'm hearing it. That's a lie. <laughs> that is such a lie, but I love the lie. <laughs> the question that was sent to me that I need your help with is, what are the challenges of cross-cultural relationships and should they be attempted at all? It depends on how you define culture. I'm assuming that maybe the, uh, the person who's asked the question is talking about uh, interracial relationships. Mm -hmm. Because if we're talking about cross-cultural, it could be uh, the marriage between my father and my mother. Absolutely. You know, both Yoruba, both, you know, from uh, ruling families as they were. But two very different cultures. It's like the Jebus and the Oyos. Oyos, exactly. It's different. It's, it's different culture. And culture itself is a morphing and an ever-changing thing. I, I do wish we would stop treating culture as a static, as a, and static. As, as a given. Mm -hmm. But if, if the question is about uh, uh, interracial relationships and should they be attempted, uh, you can't stop human nature, you know. At some point, the concept of race was created, which is not real. I do wish we would stop using the term race. I, I think there's enough, we, there's knowledge now that race is not real. Mm -hmm. Under the skin, every human being is the same. Uh, the color of your skin, which is the amount of melanin in your body, has no bearing on whether or not you're fall sick or how intelligent you are, how strong you are, uh, how great a dancer you are. I mean, all these cliches, it's all based on this continued notion that race is a thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't stop human beings. You can't stop people from mixing with people. I read um, sort of like a biography recently uh, where the author talked about um, apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I had his name on my tongue right now. I just forgot. Great guy. Uh, I'll remember him now. Uh, talk show host in America. Trevor Noah? Trevor Noah. His parents got together when he was illegal. Yeah, I read that book. Uh, yeah, Yeah, Born a Crime. Born a Crime, rather. Yeah. You know, and he made the observation, the very human observation, that you, you just can't stop people from falling yeah. in love with each other. And did you see the absurdity of the rules? Yes. It was absurd. Yeah. You know? It was, it was beyond... I mean, it was designed by... The, the, the entire apartheid thing was designed by one person, isn't it? Mm. And this is the problem with allowing one person too much power because this person was probably sick, was probably deranged, was probably evil in some pathological way, you know. And um, it convinced them that you can group people into uh, whites and uh, colors and natives and, and so on and so forth. And they had. I mean, you've read the book, or you know about things like the pencil test, mm -hmm. and you could be white today, and because you've offended someone in, 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 in government, you can suddenly become classed as black. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they didn't have a class for Chinese people, so they became black. But because they needed uh, money or some form of help from Japan, Japanese people were honorary white. It's crazy. You know, it's, it's madness. And it's a good example, if you study that madness, and extrapolated into societies that are so-called freer. Mm -hmm. I think maybe people will begin to understand this. You, you and I were talking about skin color earlier, even amongst so-called black people, mm -hmm. because I am fairer skin. Mm -hmm. I call myself 
toast in the summer and caramel mm -hmm. in the winter because my skin darkens and lightens. Mm -hmm. So if we were to go by the pencil test, yeah, I might be nearer white. Oh yeah, you in, might be yeah. in the winter months and then black in, in the, the summer months. Why is it so difficult for people to understand that race is an artificial construct? Because we keep using the word race, because we keep teaching. On the one hand, you're telling people race is not real. On the other hand, it's okay to say you're this race, you know, to ask you on a government form, what race are you to take a race? You I know. hate those forms yeah, everybody... where they put that black Caribbean, black American, black uh, other well, uh, European, and I'm like, <sighs> but we keep, but you know, we keep doing it. We keep telling each other that race is real. And so long as that's what you're teaching people and you've taught them this all through their lives, they would believe it. Look at South Africa. After apartheid, right? During apartheid, they actually had people living separately, right? Uh, the colors are their own areas. The whites are their own areas. The natives are their own areas and everything. And it was illegal to mix. Now, apartheid is over. You would expect that these communities would start mixing. Mm. And let's not... Let's not blame every white South African for apartheid. A lot of them, the mass majority of white South Africans were against it. Mm -hmm. We're fighting against it. Of, of course, the government then wouldn't let us know this. But till today, I go to South Africa and I see the separation. Yeah. I remember uh, in Stellenbosch, I was going to go see a play. I didn't know where it was. I considered walking there, but I was running late. So I got an Uber. So I said to the Uber guy on the way there, is it? Is it close enough so I can walk back? Black man from East Africa, it wasn't South African. He says, oh, no, 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 don't walk back from there. It's a very dangerous place. Why? It's a colored area. Mm. This is his thought about colored people. Yeah. And I, I bet that colored people also think black yeah, areas yeah, are yes. dangerous, yeah. you know, yeah. and so on and so forth. Now, because this is what they've learned growing up, even now that it's no longer illegal to mix, they're still holding on to it. This is what they know. So I think a deliberate effort has to be made to change the thinking of people. I really want to talk about easy motion sure. tourists. <laughs> I really, really do. Because the thing that excited me about this was I found for, and I hadn't seen it particularly in books out of, out of Nigeria uh, in recent times. A few of them, yes, but not a lot of them, where the characters didn't need to be explained. Mm -hmm. They were just human. And they were deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. They were layered, you know, and there mm -hmm. were people that I loved, you know. Mm -hmm. like what, what the, those two guys, um, slow, go slow. Go slow and knock out. Go slow and knock out. You know, I knew, I know <laughs> go slow and knock out. Yes. <laughs> I know the inspector, uh, mm -hmm. Ibrahim. I know, I even know Prissy Amaka and oh, yeah. the other, I know Amaka. <laughs> I know all of these people. And I know them as Amaka. Mm -hmm. Not as anything other than Amaka. Mm -hmm. And I also recognize Guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I recognize that guy, Guy. Guy. <laughs> so why didn't you write a writerly writer book? Well... Do you know what I mean by writerly writer? I do. I'm not going to mention books that might, you know, prove that I do. Mm -hmm. um, but I do. I totally understand what you mean by that. And um, why didn't I write that? Because I wouldn't read such books, you know. And um, I would only write what I would read. It's like if you're cooking, you know, for, you want to, if, if you want to cook the kind of things you want to eat, you know, mm -hmm. and I would only, I only write the kind of stories I would read. Um, sadly, it seems a lot of writers in Africa are writing to supply a particular demand, either real or they think is there for a certain kind of literature. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the prizes uh, uh, for African literature, they also seem, I think, to reinforce this notion that African literature has to be this, has to be that. Mm. Uh, I'm thankful that people like Nnedi Okara for uh, mm -hmm. breaking that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the, the writing award-winning uh, genre fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, HBO is about to do, Her yeah, too, yeah, which is amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, if you think about it, for me, growing up in Nigeria, I read books like Easy Motion Tourist. Mm -hmm. I read the Pace Setters books. Do you know, I was saying that we had this. Yeah. 
I read all the Pesetta books. Yeah. I read Amos to our last books. Oh. All of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, I read Chino <clears throat> Achebe the way Chino yeah. Achebe right? without sparseness, without lameness. Crisp, yeah. You know, without, I hate self indulgent books. Yeah, that's the right word, self indulgent. <laughs> self indulgent, and they're classified as literary books mm. so that we need to prove that we are intelligent to be able to understand it. My intelligence, as Wale Shoinga says, is my tigritude. <laughs> I do not need yeah. to prove it. But you, you said something that I thought was really powerful when you said the challenge with writing for you, and I'm going to come back to the book I said, all that is you could do, you were concerned about making money mm -hmm. from writing. Mm -hmm. You've just been able to make a living from writing. I took it from an interview you did mm -hmm. some, some, mm -hmm. somewhere. And that took me back to the issue of African writers writing for a niche market mm -hmm. and writing so-called this literary book, mm -hmm. the literary tra tradition. And there's nothing wrong with writing literary book. Mm -hmm. Although I will question li a literary, literary book that's not unreadable anyway to most yeah. uh, people. But my challenge was the reason why is there not a larger market? Is it just a structural thing? Mm -hmm. Or also because actually we are not writing stories people want to read. And we are not presenting the stories to people in a way that people find accessible. I'll give you an mm. example. I hate book readings. <laughs> they are so boring. They are so they're boring. They're boring. <laughs> they, I understand. <laughs> the, the writer sits, the writer reads. Yeah. There's, some people ask questions. Everybody has Afro hair. Yeah. Everybody wants a bit of Adire. Yes. What about the we're rest? African. Are we African? <laughs> and yeah. I'm thinking of all the people I see on the streets in Lagos who would love this book. Mm. And I already see a movement of a different kind of writing mm -hmm. where people are writing what we might not consider to be high-minded or anything, mm -hmm. but people are reading, people come to their events. Yes. How can we marry the two? <clears throat> well, it's, um, we can go on and on about what led to, you know, the decline of the culture of writing, you know, dramatic storytelling, genre fiction and stuff like that. You know, it, it, it probably has to do with austerity measures way back then. It has to do, you can link it to um, uh, military governments and everything. You can even look at, uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs, yeah. you know, and you know, at some point the poverty became so strong that you know I want to satisfy my immediate need for shelter for food. I don't agree. You know, I might be wrong. Do you know why I said? And this yeah. is important for people. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't use myself as an empirical um, example because it's yeah. not empirical. But you know, I. By the that cops the Buhari time in the 85, 85 mm -hmm. and so Nigeria became so bad, mm. you know, we became so dead poor in my family, so poor, you know, it was almost impossible to eat. Yeah. But myself and a lot of other kids my age at that time will still go to mile two under bridge and buy secondhand books. Yeah. We bought books with the little bits of money that we had. True. We exchange books in school. I remember in primary school then, we would exchange pesetos. We yes. would exchange, even though it was dated then, and it blighted novels and stuff absolutely. like that. Absolutely. You, you are absolutely right. So I'm, what I'm saying is, I don't know what the reason is, but there's a decline, or there was a decline in such writing. It, maybe it was just Macmillan leaving, you know, or something. But at some point, we stopped writing books like Cyprian Equence's mm -hmm. books. You know, Jaguanana was amazing. I love Jaguanana. You know, and uh, I want to play Jaguarana. Oh, you should. So I don't know why we haven't. I don't understand why Nollywood, you know, has not done Jaguarana or redone uh, some of the other things that were done because Jaguarana was done then, mm. I, I, if I remember right. You know, but something happened. Um, I've linked it once upon a time to when we had beautiful Nigerian music. Amazing. I still listen to them. You know, we had the Victor Wifos. We had uh, this gentleman who died recently. Oh, yeah, bo. Oh, yeah, bo. Mm -hmm. You know, we had music ahead of its time. Right? Rex Lawson. Rex Lawson. All of them. Not just Nigeria, Swing Popo and yeah. all of that. And it was amazing Even music. Even Apala music. Oh, it was amazing. You know, 
the music from Del the Del North. Del Yeah. It, it was authentic. It was real music, right? And then that declined, and we started having Nigerians doing reggae in Nigeria, mm -hmm. doing rap, doing pop. We went through a phase where we started copying. We started trying to be like what television was showing us the West was, and we decided to try that. And that led to a decline in the quality of the music, and even in the industry itself. Mm -hmm. Because people, without naming artists, they did not make as much money from the reggae. Yeah, in Nigeria, you're doing reggae, you know, as the uh, Obeys mm -hmm. made, mm -hmm. and are still making, mm -hmm. as King Sonia Day, mm -hmm. you know, as, you know. A lot of the Fuji musicians uh, are yeah. still <laughs> making money. Oliver De Coke, Oliver De Coke you know. at that time. But now, look at the new music we're doing. Mm -hmm. We've come back to the roots. Mm -hmm. Now we're singing, we're doing music that America is copying. Yeah. You know, uh, Shakira and the rest of them. Snoop Dogg wants to do collabs with Nigerian artists. Mm -hmm. You know, Whiskey is international. I just know. want to see Snoop and Whiskey. Oh. I just want to see Snoop and Whiskey. <laughs> yeah. well, isn't there an element of something that we are missing? Mm. If you go to either the books or the music, one of the things that happened with the military era and the collapse of institutions in Nigeria yeah. was that publishing, um, uh, record labels and all of that, they moved out of the country. A lot of them yeah. haven't been foreign anyway. Mm -hmm. And the ones that were Nigerian owned became starved. I remember mm -hmm. my, my, one of my best friends was Bola Tito Onibogje. And once you heard Onibogje, yeah. you think publishing yeah. and all of yeah. that died. Yeah. So something else replaced it. Mm -hmm. It was those guys selling under the bridge. Yes. The distribution became more, more informal, mm -hmm. more generic and mm -hmm. informal. But because we have never understood Nigeria's informal sector, it's the same thing mm -hmm. with Nollywood. It went from the films, Busy Daughter of the River and all of that, yeah. Ogun Day and all those films, mm -hmm. to, to what is now known VCD. as Nollywood. They went to video films because, well, they couldn't do anything else at that mm -hmm. time. So we were fascinated with the results without looking at the structure. Mm -hmm. And so the structure of distribution through all those Ebimpe John Lane guys, mm -hmm. through the guys selling on the streets, mm -hmm. isn't that the key? I, that I, we should actually, because it's about distribution, it's about yeah. being able to get it to people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I, I totally believe that the problem is distribution. Uh, right now, as of now, anyway. Uh, making these books as accessible to people and at a good price. Yeah. Because right now, the one thing competing for your money in Nigeria, when you think of books or even movies, is your phone airtime. Yeah. Right? So the books need to be priced such that if I'm thinking, should I load up credits so that I've got internet or should I buy a book? It'll be easy. Oh, I can buy this book. There's just so much. And for that to happen, the government, we need a government that is intellectually, that is culturally aware. The government has to get behind booksellers, has to get behind publishers. It needs to be a deliberate thing. <laughs> I'm laughing. You said something funny. What's this? Government that's culturally aware. Uh, well, it's, I know. Government <laughs> culturally aware. This question came from your own um, audience, and All it right. says, as your work is deeply inspired by your background, are you interested in writing a piece where the hero comes from a different background than yours? I noticed mm. the word hero, mm -hmm. not heroine. Yeah, that's, I don't know why people make that mistake, but I don't let it disturb me anymore because, you know, I refer to female actors as actors, not actresses now. So, mm. yeah, the hero is Amaka. People think it's Guy Collins. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's amazing. I know it's partly my fault, uh, a for giving him a, him a narrative voice, but that really helped the story. And also, but then also, look, The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. you know, um, Heart of Darkness. The narrator is not always the hero, as mm -hmm. it were. But anybody who reads the book from cover to cover will know without an iota of doubt who the hero is. It's Absolutely. Amaka. I thought it was Amaka. Oh, of course, it was, it was Amaka. definitely Amaka. It's, it's, in fact, the book is part of what I'm calling the Amaka series. Yeah. Not the Amaka and Guy series, but yeah. the Amaka series. Amaka. It's about Amaka. Mm -hmm. She's the one who, who does all the interesting things, mm -hmm. you know, but she's not self-obsessed, so she's not going to be narrating herself and telling you, oh, look at all these amazing things I'm doing, you mm -hmm. know. So somebody else is, you know, is, is, is recording I the I didn't mind the different her. points of views because I thought they mm -hmm. made 
the stories stronger. Mm. Let me start with Guy. Yeah. Because this person is asking, would you write somebody? I mean, you already wrote Guy in there. Yeah. You know, he's not the hero, but no. he's, he's in there. What I like about what you did about Guy is that you wrote about somebody that I could see. Mm -hmm. You put layers in there because obviously he wasn't a white savior in Africa. No. I like the fact that he's, he's a naive young English man. Yeah who falls in love with a Nigerian girl in yeah. England and is not working and then wants to, you know, prove to her that, okay, if I go to your land and I survive yes. there, you know, <laughs> I know guys like that. <laughs> and he just ups, you know, because, he, you know, his, all his life is lived, you know, maybe in Europe yeah. and he thinks, I'll just fly over there. Maybe I'll, I'll get Uber. I'll be, it'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. I'll come back with pictures. I'll have pictures. <laughs> You My know? Instagram will be on flick. <laughs> Absolutely. And guy <laughs> grows up very quickly. Oh, yeah. Like Lagos can Like Lagos, grow you up. yes. <laughs> but also the ways in which he engages this simultaneous disgust and love. Mm. Because that's natural, especially yeah. if you've never experienced it before. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I love that scene where, you know, he's pretending he's a BBC reporter, the police, and I love the policeman. Yes, you know, I love what you did with the policeman. Just his, his nastiness on one hand. Yeah. At the same time, his real desire to do his job, the complexities of his role. Mm -hmm. You know, but that bit where he was like, I'm dead here now. I mean, this is the end. <laughs> this is it. And how it just flips. Yeah. Because I've always thought that was true of Lagos. It is quite true of Lagos. Lagos is, uh, can be a paradox. Lagos is... I mean, I lived in Lagos for a very long time, and very often I would still be shocked by discovering something new about Lagos. Just like any human being, if you get to know them enough and you pay attention enough, you discover new things about them, just like we discover new things about ourselves. So, yes, that is what Lagos is, you know. To answer the question, though, about um, writing from uh, another background yeah. apart from mine, Easy motion tourists has a lot to do with prostitution and sex work and all of that. So I wonder what the uh, person asking the question is talking about, with, about my background. I don't have a background in prostitution. <laughs> but that said, um, I have written from the perspective of something totally, someone totally different to me. In fact, it's what I consider to be the best, in the, at least a piece of writing I've done that I'm closest to. And it's uh, a novella I wrote online. Uh, we're going to publish an edited version of it very soon called Chronicles of a Ron's Girl. Yeah. The narrative voice throughout was a woman, mm -hmm. a young girl, mm -hmm. uh, coincidentally called Amaka as well. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like a prequel to Easy Motion Tourist mm -hmm. because in the last chapter we meet Amaka of Easy Motion Tourist. And this was written, unlike my other writing, unlike Easy Motion Tourist, from a single point of view that of the narrative voice, of the female narrative voice. I am neither female, nor do I come from the background she comes from. I, I have never lived a day in the life she's lived, or as far as, you know, uh, the life I've given her. But you can write from any point of view. What's important is empathy. If you can try to understand people, to genuinely want to get to know them, to if you can feel a human connection, feel their pain, you know, uh, smile with them. You know, they, they're uncomfortable, you're uncomfortable. Right. If you can have empathy with any human being, then you can understand them. And if you can understand them, then you can write about them. And in fact, I dare say, writing from a different point of view is also an exercise in getting to know people. Uh, there was an experiment with racism mm -hmm. where they had people who had subconscious racist biases. They had them <clears throat> uh, write out what they thought somebody of a different race was feeling in situations they exposed them to. Too. And just by writing in the first person about a different, someone of a different so-called race, mm -hmm. changed the feelings of these people. You know, empathy, just connecting, just realizing. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about empathy and it seems like it's often difficult to get people to naturally we would mm -hmm. have thought that we're naturally empathetic towards one another mm -hmm. but it doesn't happen ordinarily what what helps it along well i think we lose opinion. it we 
other things get in the way. If you look at children at play, a child would naturally, a baby, would start crying because another baby is crying. It's hardwired into us. Um, as a child grows older and the child becomes to have agency, becomes to recognize that this other baby's pain is not my pain, they still react to it, you know. They take their toy over to the crying child. They, they pull their mom over to the crying child. So is the schooling you know? around all these other things? We unlearn it. We, 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 so, which is, of course, why this also is very... I don't want to start to terms like groundbreaking and all of that, but for me, a very... Oh, please do. Just, very important. You can book. say because groundbreaking. You're right. <laughs> because you're right. You're, you're humanizing prostitutes here. Mm. You're making us see beyond what they do. I mean, in mm -hmm. the course of my career, I have talked to everybody. And I remember some of the most powerful people I ever talked with were prostitutes. Mm -hmm. And I used powerful in a very loose manner. Because I used to talk with these girls at... Um, uh, there was a bar in Lagos where they mm -hmm. used to hang to meet particularly actually mm -hmm. men from Europe. Yeah. And then also in, in Port Harcourt, I met quite a number mm -hmm. of, um, of prostitutes. And I've always been able to see them first as who they are and mm -hmm. see the situation. But prostitutes generally and across culture, mm -hmm. you know, are kind of like the other other. Mm. You know, and you have taken a story where there's a female um, lead who's championing the cause. The, the cause. Yeah. Where did all that come from? Well, the entire idea for the story was... I mean, uh, the right answer would have been, I like prostitutes. Well, I like everybody, you know, and um, I can't say exactly where it came from, but I've had human connections with sex workers in Nigeria, you know. I was in Kiev, uh, Ukraine, uh, for, uh, for work, and then I've never told the story publicly. Cool. About four of us, you know, I was the only black kid that black man and three other white guys. Uh, we were taken, you know, by our host, as it were, to a bar. It turned out to be a street bar. And we are sat there and this extremely gorgeous women who, you know, if they were walking the streets of London, somebody would spot them and they'll be the Models highest space. Oh yeah. yeah. They they looked amazing, I must say. And they were there. So it was obvious it was a strip joint. But what I did not realize was that it was more than that. And somebody else, uh, I'm not saying one of my colleagues or even the people we're working with, but somebody, uh, had arranged for these girls to come to us. And so they brought, there was four of us, so they brought this about seven girls to us, lined up in front of our table. And the idea was for each one of us to pick somebody. And as this friends of mine, you know, pretended to be shy and afraid, but went ahead and we're gonna go for private dances. I kept having one single thought from looking at the women and looking at the way they... Um, there's a lot of signals we give, which is unspoken. And the one thought on my mind was, do you want to put, whether or not I would use a prostitute, do you want to put any one of those girls in the position of the one who went with a black man? Because I could feel in them something from the look in their eyes, like, don't pick me. And it wasn't disgust, it wasn't racism that I felt, but the consequences of being the person. Because I'll be in Kiev, several times I'll be in Kiev, and I'll be the only black person I'll see for five days, for 10 days. The only other black person would be some Nigerian guy in the airport, you know? And just that you could tell that or just me putting myself in their shoes, which is something I, I, I want people to do more often. I didn't want in any way for somebody to have to bear that burden. And so going back to what you've said about, you know, meeting sex workers and they're some of the most real people, I think it's because of the amount of pain they're made to confront in order to survive in 
in doing what they do. Most of us, we can count the number of days we've had to um, do something we really don't want to do. They get to do something very intimate that they really don't want to do several times a day. Very, very few of us can tell somebody, oh yeah, I've been in a situation where I feared for my life. They're constantly in a situation where they're afraid for their lives. You know, so their emotions are on a different level. They get stronger stimulus than you and I on a daily basis. So naturally they'll be more, their brains will have created connections, you know, that neural path that you and I just can't comprehend. The bit of the story that I want to go back to briefly mm. is your recognition at that point that in doing this, this person will have to bear burden yeah. that will make their lives harder. Yep. You also had to override another consideration, and that is your own ego as, but just because I'm black, why would this person? Mm -hmm. Because the issue is not just because you're black. No. The issue is nuanced. Oh, very. Very nuanced. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I'm not going to comment more on it, but I'm going to <clears throat> point it out no. as something that's very powerful. Because in different situations of either oppression or disregard or, you know, just the way we treat each other badly as human beings, there are different calls we can make. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the easiest one is the one that solves our ego. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. an awareness of the other calls that possibly makes life better for others. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something we talk about too often. Can I just, it's something we unlearn. We're talking about why, why empathy is something that seems to be missing. Look, it's in the telling men, be boys, you have to be a man. And you have to be a man means you shouldn't cry, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say sorry, you shouldn't accept that from somebody. We teach people, we actively teach people not to feel, not to care, to be selfish, you know. And um, yeah, so maybe if we stop doing that, if we stop taking away that which is naturally human from children, you know, for, yeah. maybe then we would start becoming better as human beings. So, well, there were many, many flawed human beings in this story. Mm -hmm. You know, but none of them was, I mean, very few of them could you stay hating only. Mm -hmm. That was also something I really, really like. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pointing out what, in my mind, something is saying to me, but for me, of course, this is what the book should have. Mm -hmm. But the only reason I'm pointing it out is not, it's, it's not that common anymore, particularly in, the, in our modern societies. And this is a cross board. There's what I like to call sloganizing. Mm. So we want people to be a certain way. And we create characters that are that way. So the woman is virtuous or this or that. Mm -hmm. She cannot be a, a woman cannot just love sex and still be a good Christian. No. Oh, you like sex? No, you're going to hell. <laughs> a man cannot be vulnerable and still be really, really strong and be the ruler. Mm -hmm. You know, be, be able to, to be open about it. Um, um, emotions and still be the Aliko Dangote of that country. Mm. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing I liked in the book. For you, where did it all come from? Because you said that thing to me, which I thought was also very important about pain. Mm. I've also always said I don't trust people who don't who have not learned mm. to ride pain and to live with pain. Mm. Because then, how do you how do you know? How can you relate? How can you relate? So anything really. I think in most of the things I've written, uh, except for some sci-fi type short mm -hmm. stories, the people, I try to make them people, like real. There's a, an exercise they teach writers, I don't do it myself, which is to write a backstory for your characters. And, um, and then you write it like, you know, there's a piece of writing you're going to throw away, but the actual exercise of writing the backstory then informs them. I think I do a short court. I, I think I, I imagine people. It's just like writing them as well. And then I imagine them as people I know or 
you know, I sense check, would the person really be like this? Mm -hmm. Would, uh, would Amaka, you know, if you asked me to describe Amaka, for instance, who someone as a person, as Omo Fictor, in, in fact, I respect her and I admire her. But if you ask me to describe her, I'll tell you that she's a very nasty person. Mm -hmm. I'll say that she's, uh, she can be very self-centered mm -hmm. in the way she goes about stuff. She, she can be thoughtless sometimes. But this is how human beings are. Mm -hmm. You know, very few people are one way all the time. Absolutely. You know, very few people are evil all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, look at uh, Knockout, who is this terrible human being but has compassion for dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is true of human beings. Recently, we discovered the so-called billionaire kidnapper in Nigeria. You know, but look at his family. They didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. You know, at least the children didn't mm -hmm. know about mm -hmm. it. All they know is their father, and he's been a father to them. He's been, you know, on the one hand, he goes about kidnapping people, torturing them, killing them, causing extreme pain for their families, and sometimes loss of life, sometimes loss of savings and everything. But on the other hand, he can go home and still be a father. You know, still have them sit on his lap. Isn't that also like the politicians, where oh, people, yeah. somebody steals a fortune? Oh yeah. You know, and in stealing a fortune, millions of people die. Oh yeah. You know, but it's also our friend and our uncle. Mm -hmm. And how do you not have judgment and just know this? I mean, with politicians, we must have judgment. Yeah. That's collective. You mm -hmm. know, but with, with how do you, how do you marry justice, judgment, and empathy? By accepting the flaws in yourself, by, I mean, one of the ways I think is by, if you really look and examine your own life and who you are and your thinking and your actions and your responses to stuff, you might discover, in my case, that, okay, I'm not so great all the time. Mm. But if you asked me, you know, are you a good person? Yeah, I believe I am. But there are times I'll do things that I'll think about later on and think, okay, I should have had I should have behaved differently. I should have acted differently. I should have said something different. I wasn't good in that situation. Mm. But I can, I can justify it. You know, if, if I don't examine it, then I can automatically justify my actions. You know, I can take, for instance, every single one of us, we believe we're good, right? Mm. We're nice, we're good, we, you know, we think of other human beings. But we can walk past in winter, we can walk past a beggar in a very thin sleeping bag who we know is going to sleep out in the cold and freeze to death. We can walk by and not put a coin in, in his cup. We can justify it automatically by telling ourselves he's only going to go have drugs. Sometimes when we even drop a coin, even sometimes when we're taken, overtaken by God knows what, and we look in our wallet for, no, I'm not going to give you a coin, I'm going to give you real proper money. And we look for that five pound note and drop it. We've still not done anything. We've only used, we've only bought justification. Because you still walk away, going back to your warm home, you know, your, the safety of your house, while you've left another human being. And a lot of them die from exposure. Yeah. But we can do it. There's... Uh, also we because justify. we think somebody else will take care of it. Yeah, it's not my problem. Somebody else will do it. And we the don't ensure that it. whoever we allow the responsibility for our collective, you know, does do what they need to do. Change but why do you round. think Nigerians don't get satire? <sighs> I mean, let's not say Nigerians. Certainly, some, we, we, but it seems majority don't get satire. Let me put it this way. I wouldn't say Nigerians don't get satire. But there's a breed or a class or a subculture of Nigerians who don't seem to get satire, who uh, believe in Illuminati, mm. who go to church. I'm generalizing, you know, but I, I, when, when I think of people who simply don't get satire, I think of, you know, churchgoers and deeply religious, homophobic, anti-everything people who are close-minded. Mm. And I think you can make an argument for clo close-mindedness and the ability to appreciate, you know, the finer things in life, you know. Mm. 
to be able to appreciate culture. To, I mean, it's, if you're close-minded, it is exactly what it is. You're close-minded. Yeah. You know, and you just cannot see another possibility. So yeah. it has to be black or white. And mm -hmm. satire sort of, you know, exists in that in between. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke once when somebody asked the question about what you would love. I can't remember the question probably. You said, what would you love to be? You said you would love to be invincible. You know, you would love, because the idea of invisibility is just yeah, great. Why wouldn't you want to be yeah. invisible? And I thought, what does it mean? Be invisible, you can people watch. I do something on the train. Uh, part of my ritual when I'm going into work every morning is I, I, I do my breathing on, you know, uh, uh, abdominal breathing on the train and then when I can't stop my mind from wandering I just pick people and I imagine lives for them you know I just imagine you know this person is probably uh, and it's amazing lives you know KGB operatives who's forgotten who doesn't realize if I was on the train what if you if you were on the train know me. and I didn't know you <laughs> what am I letting myself in for I'll be looking at you and I might imagine I see this person and she's on her phone and say you have a very blank look at the phone so it's not laughing or crying or whatever. I might think, okay, they've carried on the argument from last night. She's had time to sleep over this argument with him again, which they should not have had. And um, the reason this argument has continued on the phone. I don't like it. <laughs> you asked for it, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's too much man, too much man, I so know. much emotion towards man. Oh my God, there's no I'm food sorry. in it. No food, no. <laughs> no food, no money, no work, no Nigeria. Those are the only things that keep me up. <laughs> but I like the idea of seeing myself as a woman. I should find a man to organize over. This is the point where I've come to that question that you get to ask me. Ah, ah. What are your thoughts on decriminalization of sex work in Nigeria? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. I've looked at it. I've, mm -hmm. you know, I get into trouble because I'm considered this flaming liberal mm -hmm. who's just doing this thing because it's cool. I'm not cool. I've never wanted to be cool. Mm. I've always wanted to be me. What I am is try to the best of my ability to ensure that we don't stop human beings from being well and living well. Thank you. In the process of it, of course, you have to come against all the ideas that we need to unpack and unlearn. Mm -hmm. I think that if it is no longer a crime, those who choose sex work will choose sex work and it will be organized better. Be protected. Then it will take away the incentive to then to abuse yes. people. Because the challenge with it is the ways in which, because it's underground, yeah. the, the workers have no rights. The workers have no recourse, no. and there are all kinds of people milking, particularly young girls and boys too. Boys too, yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, I, I roll my eyes while we talk about decriminalizing in Nigeria because the challenge with Nigeria is bigger than even the laws. Because if mm. by some miracle, and that future will come, we did manage to do that in Nigeria, then you'll have to enforce it, won't you? Yeah. And the challenge really is the structure and the institutions to be able to do that. Yeah. But first things first, we should start having a conversation mm -hmm. about, and if you wanted my support, I would be open. Cool. So, because so, I have all these girls whose faces, I can remember their mm. faces, I can remember their, I can remember everything about them, who spoke to me, who trusted me with their story. Mm. In fact, one of them is dead, and I have the rights to her story. Mm. I would like to humanize them. I would like that what happened to them does not happen to, to others. Yeah. So, yes. That's cool. Thank you. So we're cool. Yeah, we're cool. <laughs> right. Thank you, Le. Thank, Thank you for you this much. book. You know, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one. The next one's titled another. Th um, when trouble sleeps. When trouble sleeps, younger go Yes, it's we're currently with um, Cassava Republic, Cassava. my publishers. Right, so yes. we're we're working on editing it, but I'm making new changes which might delay the editing. But we're hoping it'll come out um, uh, first half of uh, next year. Fantastic. I can't yeah. wait to see it. A good job with Cassava too. I love what they're doing. Right, Thank that's you. my conversation. Yeah, long one, another long one. But you know what's the point of bringing people into my home if I'm not going to dig deep? <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching. Remember to send questions. Um, and I'll see you again next week.
Bye. <laughs>